introduction. Um, my, uh, my talk today is fairly light, um, so hopefully uh, it won't put you all to sleep before the smoke o break. Um, the use of sex semen um, in East Frisian sheep in New Zealand, you can probably tell from my accent, um, I'm not actually a Kiwi, I am an Australian, um, have been over in New Zealand um, for about five years. Um, particular interest in the East Frisian um, sheep in New Zealand at the moment, um, we have a, a relatively small um, sheep milking industry in New Zealand. Up until three or four years ago, um, it was only about 10 or 12 flocks. Um, most of the flocks, small flocks, 150 to 250 animals, um, milk turned into cheese um, and sold in artisan type markets locally. As well as the, the 10 or 12 small flocks of 150 to 250, we also have one large flock. Um, it's probably the biggest sheep milking flock in the world. Um, they average between 15,000 and 20,000 milking ewes. Um, they produce uh, effectively infant formula that's sold predominantly into China. Um, there's been a little bit of interest in milking sheep in New Zealand um, over the last few years, um, and it's mostly to do with, uh, with environmental concerns of dairying. Um, New Zealand is a country of about 5 million people. Um, we have about 5 million dairy cows and about 25 million sheep. Um, our export, uh, agricultural exports have been traditionally our biggest export earner, um, but now are number two behind tourism. So the environmental impacts of what we are doing in, in agriculture have really come to the, to the fore, um, politically speaking. Um, so um, we farm on very, very young pumice soils. They're, they're, the soils are volcanic um, and leach nitrogen particularly very quickly. So one of the issues with milking dairy cows is that uh, they concentrate all the nitrogen from the, the grass in our pastoral system into urine patches, um, which then allows uh, the, the urine to enter our um, waterways, which is the, the pristine nature that we sell our agricultural products and our tourism on. So there's been a lot of push from government um, in the last uh, two or three years um, to try and, one, diversify agriculture, but secondly, to diversify agriculture in a way that's more environmentally sustainable. So we have this, uh, this current project, this PGP program, which is a, uh, a primary growth partnership between government and industry. It's about a $50 million research project um, with the idea of expanding um, the milking sheep industry um, to a stage um, in, with, within only 10 or 12 years to being a, a 200 to a $700 million export industry. Um, it's most likely that we, we will still keep our sheep out on pasture. This is a new sheep dairy farm that's been opened up uh, about two years ago. Um, they milk about 3,000 ewes um, on this farm. And, uh, and this one milks about 6,000. They're pasture-based systems, but they do bring animals inside. And we think that will be the future for our system. We'll be partly outside, partly inside. We'll be a very consumer-driven industry. And our consumers, um, predominantly um, middle-class Asians, are telling us that they want to see our animals outside in the sun on good days, but they also want to see them inside, protected from the weather on bad days. Occasions. So we will have sh shedding and housing um, like this as well. Um, they'll be milked in, uh, this is uh, one of the dairies, this is a 26 a side double up twin pit, so there's 96 sets of cups um, and also a 64 internal rotary. One of the things that the government had realised um, if we want to expand from what is effectively a, an artesian type market to a large export industry is that we, we have really good knowledge in, in sheep farming. We've been farming sheep for a long time. Um, we're very good at producing milk from pasture in dairy cows. Uh, probably have the most efficient milk production system from pasture 
anywhere in the world. But combining those two things together and milking sheep is not quite as simple as what we thought it may have been initially. So one of the things that was holding up um, the, the expansion of the industry was the, the knowledge and the management skills. So part of the PGP program is working around that. The other thing that's holding it up was the, the genetics. New Zealand um, has probably the toughest biosecurity um, regulations anywhere in the world. We haven't introduced any sheep, germplasm, bee semen or embryos for 26 years. Um, the last lot that came in 26 years ago, there was some milking sheep genetics in there. We bought some embryos in, we implanted them on an island, we uh, waited for those progeny to be born, we, we collected embryos from those and took those and implanted them in a quarantine farm. It was about an $8 million project and we managed to get in eight females and four males 26 years ago. And so this has been the basis of our sheep milking industry. One of the things that the, the government had realised is if we wanted to expand um, this sheep milking industry that we had to be able to import um, semen and embryos. So two years ago, um, the decision was made that uh, we would have very restricted imports from um, the UK and from France. So the background of that being important to what we did was because if, we, uh, if we've had almost no um, imported genetics and suddenly we, we managed to get some at quite a high cost, we wanted to work out whether we could use sex semen in embryo transfer programs to rapidly increase the numbers of the, the animals that we were bringing in and also to be able to quickly put selection pressure on the animals that we currently had and to use those ones that uh, were actually performing and breed those animals up very quickly. So these are some of the genetics, uh, these Friesian genetics that were brought in. Um, Currently, the average milking sheep in New Zealand does about 150 litres per lactation. Uh, most of the genetics we've brought in have come from flocks that are averaging six to 700 litres per lactation. So we did this little experiment um, as a trial. It was, uh, and, and this is all in the abstract, so I'm not going to go through this very much at all. Basically, we put a small number of ewes. It was only 22 donor ewes. 15 got sex semen. Seven got conventional semen. We put them through a standard embryo transfer program, inseminated them at 38 hours <coughs> after cedar pull, and we got basically the same results either way. So we thought well, this was pretty good. It was only one ram, so it was only one ram went through the sexing machine. It was sexed fresh semen. Um, so the, the semen was sorted the, the evening before we did the inseminating, um, and it all went pretty well. Um, these Frisian um, embryos were implanted into New Zealand Romney ewes um, and we got a really nice crop of lambs born. So this was, uh, this was two years ago. So last year, or this year I should say, we decided that uh, with the new genetics we'd really ramp this program up. Um, so not... Um, so, so wanting to get stuck into it, um, we programmed up 120 donor ewes and about 1,000 recips, um, put them through exactly the same program. I think uh, because, of, uh, because of issues of, uh, of inbreeding, there was about 10 um, ewes that uh, were inseminated to um, conventional semen at the same time. They were inseminated 40 hours after cedar pool. Um, and uh, the, the donors responded really nicely um, and we collected somewhere um, in the order of about 1,000 unfertilised oocytes. So we then had to start, uh, start looking at saying, well, what was different this time to, to what we did the time before? Our fertilisation rate was down around 5%, whereas previously it had been really, really good. We repeated the study again, we repeated the, the collection again. Um, this time um, we were concerned that there wasn't a lot of the ewes had ovulated um, when, we, uh, when we had inseminated them laparoscopically. Um, and we didn't actually keep accurate records of that, but it was just our impression that we didn't notice a, a lot of ewes had, had ovulated. So we, we took another small group um, of just 40 um, donor ewes 
Um, and we decided that we would delay the insemination to 50 hours with the sex semen. Um, and of course, it's always really, it's challenging. Um, we're using ram, um, ram lambs um, because the, the newer genetics obviously are really important to us. Um, so we're always fighting to get good semen quality to start with and, and XY technologies have very stringent requirements around uh, the, particularly the concentration um, of that semen um, for the sexing. Um, so we repeated it again. This time we, we inseminated them at 50 hours um, post cedar pool um, and unfortunately got very similar results. I think our, uh, our fertilisation rates were around about 10%. So not uh, wanting to give up, uh, three weeks later we did another group of, of 80 ewes. We took this right out to 60 hours. So we inseminated these ewes 60 hours after cedar pool, which is about full 24 hours later than what we would conventionally do. We noticed that the ewes had, um, about 60 or 65% of the ewes had ovulated and our results were back up to what we had done um, previously. Um, we repeated that twice more and I think we've collected... Uh, um, a couple thousand embryos now, um, and it appears that uh, the timing of 60 hours is important, um, but I think it's most important that, uh, and what we've learned from all this, is that particularly with the use of, of sex semen, um, and our experiences with uh, fresh sex semen, is that uh, the use must have ovulated um, before you do the laparoscopic AI. Um, it is only a, a relatively small trial. You know, we've only repeated it four times. There, there is a large number of views in, in each of those repetitions, of course, um, but it is, only, uh, it is only four times that we've, we've repeated it. But it does appear that uh, the ovulation status of the ewes at the time of fixed time insemination is the most important thing when it comes to uh, fertilisation rates and then conception rates with sex-sorted semen. Thank you very much.